selfless efforts of thousands of people from around the national security enterprise, nuclear security enterprise, and their predecessors are responsible for this breakthrough. We honor their intelligence, their commitment, and their determination. Going forward, we know we'll have, we will make further breakthroughs, we'll have further setbacks. But all of this is in the interest of promoting national security, pushing towards a clean energy future, and redefining, redefining the boundaries of what's possible. Thank you for being here. I'd like to introduce Marv Adams, the Deputy Administrator for Defense Programs, to speak on this achievement. Thank you, Administrator Ruby. A paraphrasal of Abraham Lincoln strikes me as fitting here. The world will little note nor long remember what we say here, but it can never forget what they did at the National Ignition Facility. <laughs> so let's recap. A team at Lawrence Livermore National Lab, National Ignition Facility made the following happen. There's a tiny cylinder here at the end of this that you probably can't see. It's about so tall and this wide. Inside that was a, a small spherical capsule about half the diameter of a BB. 192 laser beams entered from the two ends of the cylinder and struck the inner wall. They didn't strike the capsule, they struck the inner wall of this cylinder and deposited energy. And that happened in less time than it takes light to move 10 feet, so it's kind of fast. X-rays from the wall impinged on the spherical capsule. Fusion fuel in the capsule got squeezed. Fusion reactions started. This had all happened before, 100 times before. But last week, for the first time, they designed this experiment so that the fusion fuel stayed hot enough, dense enough, and round enough for long enough that it ignited and it produced more energies than the lasers had deposited. About two megajoules in, about three megajoules out, a gain of 1.5. The energy production took less time than it takes light to travel one inch. Kind of fast. So this is pretty cool. Um, I have a special message to listeners who want to work on exciting, challenging, and important problems. We're hiring. <laughs> So, fusion, fusion is an essential process in modern nuclear weapons, and fusion also has the potential for abundant clean energy. As you have heard, and we'll hear more, the breakthrough at NIF <clears throat> does have ramifications for clean energy. More immediately, this achievement will advance our national security in at least three ways. First, it will lead to laboratory experiments that help NNSA defense programs continue to maintain confidence in our deterrent without nuclear explosive testing. Second, it underpins the credibility of our deterrent by demonstrating world-leading expertise in weapons-relevant weapons technologies. That is, we know what we're doing. Third, continuing to assure our allies that we know what we're doing and continuing to avoid testing will advance our nonproliferation goals, also increasing our national security. The achievement we celebrate today illustrates that big, important accomplishments often take longer and require more effort than originally thought, and that these accomplishments are often more than worth that time and effort that they took. With that, I would like to welcome my friend and colleague, Dr. Kim Budell the director of Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory, to speak about her laboratory this evening. Madam Secretary, Dr. Prabhakar, Administrator Ruby, and Deputy Administrator Adams, thank you for your remarks today and for your support. This is a historic achievement for the team at Livermore, our collaborators in academia and labs in the U.S. and abroad, our industry partners, the fusion community writ large, 
and the many supporters and stakeholders in the National Nuclear Security Administration, the Department of Energy, and in Congress, who've ensured we could reach this moment, even when the going was tough. Over the past 60 years, thousands of people have contributed to this endeavor, and it took real vision to get us here. Building the National Ignition Facility was an enormous scientific and engineering challenge. I like Dr. Prabhakar's <laughs> emphasis on the importance of bringing those two together. In the end, after all that work, the laser has exceeded its performance goals, opened whole new areas of high energy density science to exploration, and delivered the data we need to keep our nuclear deterrent safe, secure, and effective. Our pursuit of fusion ignition over the past decade at NIF was an incredibly ambitious technical goal. Many said it was not possible. The laser wasn't energetic enough. The targets would never be precise enough. Our modeling and simulation tools were just not up to the task of this complex physics. Progress has taken time, but last August, when we achieved a then record yield of 1.35 megajoules, putting us at the threshold of ignition, many took notice. And last week, our pre-shot predictions, improved by machine learning and the wealth of data we've collected, indicated that we had a better than 50% chance of exceeding target gain of one. 60 years ago, when John Knuckles and his team proposed that lasers could be used to pr produce fusion ignition in the laboratory, it was beyond audacious. The laser had just been invented and was far from the mature tool we know today. But this is really what national labs are for, tackling the most difficult scientific challenges head on, learning from the inevitable setbacks, and building toward the next idea. Lawrence Livermore has been at the center of the ICF community across these many decades, and ICF has been a centerpiece of our lab. Indeed, people often say that LLNL stands for lasers, lasers, nothing but lasers. <laughs> but I think our motto sums up our approach nicely, science and technology on a mission. This achievement opens up new scientific realms for us to explore and advances our capabilities for our national security missions. It demonstrates the power of US leadership in science and technology and shows what we're capable of as a nation. And as the secretary mentioned, breakthroughs like this one have get generated tremendous excitement in the fusion community and a great deal of private sector investment in fusion energy. But this is only possible due to the long-term commitment of public investment in fusion science. The science and technology challenges on the path to fusion energy are daunting, but making the seemingly impossible possible is when we're at our very best. Ignition is a first step, a truly monumental one that sets the stage for a transformational decade in high energy density science and fusion research, and I cannot wait to see where it takes us. Thank you. And I will hand the podium back to Secretary Granholm. Great, thanks. Um, we will open up for uh, a few minutes of questions, and I think that our public affairs team, Chad, is going to be uh, navigating that, and of course we have the experts And here. just give your name and uh, your outlet, please. We're taking questions on, on this topic. Thank you. Yeah, hi, thanks. Ari Natter from Bloomberg News. Uh, I'm curious how long you think it'll be until we see commercialization of this technology, uh, and also as a follow-up, if this happened on last Monday. Why are we just hearing about it now? Thank you. Um, it's going to take a while before we uh, see this commercialized. I don't know if uh, you want to say a word about that. Sure. Um, yes, there are uh, very significant hurdles, not just in the science, but in technology. This is one igniting capsule, one time. And to realize commercial fusion energy, you have to do many things. You have to be able to produce many, many fusion ignition events uh, per minute, and you have to have um, a robust system of drivers uh, to enable that. So, you know, probably decades. Uh, not six decades, I don't think. I think not five decades, which is what we used to say. I think it's moving into the foreground and probably, you know, with concerted effort and investment, a few decades of research on the underlying uh, technologies uh, could put us in a position to build a power plant. On the question of what we've been doing for the last week, the team has been hard at work analyzing data. It turns out that when you ignite one of these capsules, it's, it's unambiguous that something big happened. Uh, you make a lot of neutrons, uh, but the data is not trivial to, to analyze, and the team invited a, their, all of their uh, team members who uh, understand the individual diagnostics 
to come in and work together to look at all the data to make sure we had the numbers right. And we brought in an external team of experts to do a peer review before we were ready to release the numbers. It's really important uh, that we tell you uh, the facts and that we get them right uh, before we go public. So that's what we've been doing for a week. So. You should probably stay there. <laughs> <laughs> Um, two quick questions. Uh, one, um, I know this, uh, the, 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 the positive uh, net return is, is the important thing, but how much energy does it take? That You talk about, the, I guess, the wall plug energy. How much wall plug energy did it take? So, and are there implications for other types of fusion? Is this something that could inform magnetic confinement fusion as well? So the laser requires about 300 megajoules of energy from the wall to drive two megajoules of laser energy, which drove three megajoules of fusion yield. Um, our calculations suggest that uh, it's possible with a laser system uh, at scale to achieve hundreds of megajoules of yield. So there is a pathway to a target that produces enough yield, but we're very distant from that right now. So 300 megajoules at the wall, two megajoules uh, in the laser. So this really is talking about target gain uh, greater than one. And then there was a second part to your question. But does it inform uh, magnetic, magnetic fusion? fusion? Yes. So there are many common uh, things about uh, plasma science and the materials you need to work in fusion environments, diagnostic techniques, et cetera. Uh, essentially, magnetic fusion uh, works at low pressures and densities and for long times, whereas inertial confinement fusion works at high pressures and densities for very short times. So there are some similarities in the underlying physics uh, but the, the fundamental concepts are quite different. Uh, <clears throat> Secretary Granholm, Pete Bear with the Indian News. Congress has charged you and the department with making decisions about the most promising designs for a pilot fusion plant, and you're in the middle of that process now. Um, how are you going to approach that, and what are your concerns about making those kind of choices? Well, clearly the um, folks who will be evaluating are uh, the professionals in this who are the scientists who do this work. And they will, like they do with all of these funding opportunity announcements, do a whole peer review process of each of the applications to determine which ones are most likely to be uh, successful given, given the challenges. There's no um, parameters on whether this is these are magnetic confinement plants or laser uh, confinement plants. Uh, we are just looking at the best proposals that come in, and hopefully we'll have a decision on that first 50 million uh, at the, uh, you know, early in the new year. Hey there, Secretary. Uh, Gary Grumbach from NBC News here. There's questions about the ability to scale here, and that was touched on a little bit as it relates to power plants, et cetera. But can you talk about the ability to scale and who should be in charge of that scaling, private, government, both? Well, clearly we want the private sector, and we need the private sector to get in the game. The, it's really important that there has been this incredible amount of U.S. public dollars going into this breakthrough. But all of the steps that we'll take that will be necessary to get this to commercial level will still require public research and private research. We know that there's been a huge interest among the private funding community, uh, startups, et cetera, and we're, we encourage that. Uh, the president has a decadal vision to get to a commercial uh, fusion reactor within, t you know, obviously 10 years. So we've got to get to work and this, this shows that it can be done, which is, was, has been a question. Can you get there? This demonstrates it can be done. That threshold being crossed allows them to start working on better lasers, more efficient lasers, on better uh, containment uh, capsules, et cetera, the things that ne are necessary to allow it to be modularized uh, and taken to commercial scale. Thanks so much. I just wanted to clarify, you're saying, you know, there's a goal to get this in a decade. You had said that there would be decades, plural, uh, in terms of commercialization. How do you reconcile that? What, and what is the timeline here? I think I get that. Um, so there's two approaches to uh, commercial fusion energy. One is based on magnetic fusion using devices like Tokamax. Uh, one is inertial fusion. There are private companies pursuing both approaches. 
um, the technology development, the foundational technology to begin to scale up toward a power plant is further along in the magnetic fusion community. And it's building more directly off the work that's been done in recent decades at uh, facilities like JET in the United Kingdom, at the Princeton Plasma Physics Lab, at MIT, uh, to build the foundational technologies up uh, for magnetic fusion energy. You know, the National Ignition Facility uh, has been focused on creating this first step. If we could not ignite capsules in the laboratory, you could not see a pathway to an inertial confinement fusion energy plant. So this was a necessary first step. But the NIF is built on, foundationally, on 1980s laser technology. So, you know, we need to bring modern technology approaches to the drivers. We need to think about all the systems questions. And now that we have a capsule that ignites, we need to figure out, can we make it simpler? Can we begin to make this process easier and more repeatable? Can we begin to do it more than one time a day? Can we start working toward rep rate? And each of these is an incredible scientific and engineering challenge for us. So while magnetic fusion may be a little bit in front, having that portfolio of approaches is really a great place to be because they'll feed, these communities will feed off each other, we'll learn, we'll continue to advance the field, and many technologies will grow out of both fields in addition to the path to a fusion power plant. So that, you know, I think having both is really important. Um, you'll hear in the panel about some of the potential advantages of an inertial confinement fusion approach. It's a little bit different. Uh, so I think it really is important to keep us on that pathway. And with investment, uh, with energy, no pun intended, sorry about that, um, with real investment and real focus, you know, that time scale can move closer. Uh, we were in a position for a very long time where it never got closer, right, because we needed this first fundamental step. So we're in a great position today uh, to begin understanding just what it will take to make that next step and then where that boundary is. I'm guessing because I don't want to give you a sense that, you know, we're going to plug the NIF into the grid. That's not, that is definitely not how this works. Um, but, but this is the fundamental building block of an inertial confinement fusion power scheme. So. Great. I'd like to acknowledge as well, um, Congresswoman Lofgren, Lofgren joined us as well. Thank you so much. And there are a number of uh, lab, you know, DOE has 17 national labs. A number of those lab directors are also populating this audience as well. I, I know that Kim would say this has been a, a group project and would acknowledge uh, the other labs that have contributed to this effort as well and are working on their solutions. So thank you everybody so much. Um, and if you hang around for a little, for a few minutes, we're gonna uh, break here and then set up for the technical panel for those who wish to stay. Thank you. The technical panel will begin in approximately 10 minutes.
that was great. Oh yeah, it was, it was wonderful. Really? <laughs> we really? <laughs> I think it's okay. I think it's all good. I think it's okay. Quick question. Yes. Um, these two women in the suit, and I don't know who they're with, but they're staff.
Testing one, two, three, four, five. Audio test five, four, three, two, one. Test one, two, three. Testing one, two, three, four, five. Audio test five, four, three, two, one. Testing one, two, three, four, five. Testing one, two, three, four. Testing one, two, three. Testing one, two, three, four, five. Testing one, two, three. Testing one, two, three. Test complete. I'm going to introduce you and then get off. Throw this underneath your. Uh, you got so I don't it. Like here
Are we ready to begin? Thank you all for staying on for this very exciting panel. I'm going to introduce the participants and then hand it over to our expert moderator. So these are the uh, rock stars from Livermore who uh, are going to tell you everything you ever wanted to know about what happened last Monday and beyond. Uh, first, we have Alex Zilstra, who was the principal experimentalist for this experiment. Annie Kreicher, the principal designer and team lead for integrated modeling. Then we have Jean-Michel de Nicola, who's the chief engineer for the NIF laser system. Michael Staterman, target fabrication program manager. And then Art Pack, the team lead for stagnation science and the lead for diagnostics on this experiment. And Tammy Ma, who's the lead for Lawrence Livermore's Inertial Fusion Energy Institutional Initiative. And now to moderate the panel, I'm going to hand the mic over to Mark Herman, who's our program director for weapons physics and design and a uh, longtime fusion guy. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, thanks. We're going to talk uh, some more about uh, today's exciting announcement, an inertial confinement fusion experiment that yielded more energy in fusion than we input with the laser. We got out 3.15 megajoules, we put in 2.05 megajoules in the laser. That's never been done before in any fusion laboratory anywhere in the world. So it's super exciting. And uh, this team and the many, many hundreds of colleagues back at Lawrence Livermore uh, are really pumped about that. Um, <clears throat> I want to be clear, ultimately this experiment, as Kim mentioned, uh, drew about 300 megajoules from the grid in order to fire the laser. The laser wasn't designed to be efficient. The laser was designed to give us as much juice as possible to make this incredible uh, conditions uh, ha happen, basically, in the laboratory. So uh, there are many, many steps that would have to be made in order to get to inertial fusion as an energy source. So in this experiment, um, we use the world's most energetic laser, the National Ignition Facility, uh, to create x-rays that cause a tiny capsule to implode uh, and create a very hot, very high pressure plasma. And that plasma um, wants to immediately lose its energy. It wants to blow apart. It wants to radiate. It's looking for ways to cool down. But the fusion reactions are depositing heat in that plasma, causing it to heat up, right? So there's a race between heating and cooling. And if the plasma gets a little bit hotter, the fusion reaction rate goes up, creating even more fusions, which gets even more heating. And, uh, and so the question is, can we win the race? And for many, many decades, we lost the race. Um, uh, the, we got more cooling out than we got the heating up. And so we didn't get to this uh, ignition event. But last Monday, that all changed, and we able, were able to win the race and get uh, very significant uh, heating of the fusion plasma up to very high temperatures, uh, which resulted in that yield of 3.15 megajoules. We study fusion ignition to keep our nuclear deterrent safe, secure, effective, and reliable. Uh, and and do so without the need for further underground nuclear weapons testing. Fusion ignition is a key process in our thermonuclear weapons. And in addition, the, the very extreme environments created when the fusion plasma ignites enables testing that ensures we can maintain and modernize our nuclear deterrent. We hope that someday, and we'll talk some more about this, fusion could provide a base load carbon-free source of energy to power our planet. So I'm very delighted to be on stage with several representatives of the incredible, incredible team that, that made this possible. And now we're going to hear more from our panel of experts. And we're going to start with Alex. Good morning. My name is Alex Zilstra. I was the principal experimentalist for the shot that we're discussing and the campaign that led up to it. And so I'm here on behalf of the experimental team. As Mark said, NIF is the most energetic laser facility in the world is where we conduct these experiments. We take the laser energy and convert it into x-rays, so we need to decide how that process will work. Use those x-rays to compress the capsule that contains the fuel. 
If we can compress the fuel by a factor of more than 10,000, it reaches densities, temperatures, and pressures that are higher than the center of the sun. And that's what's required for our approach to, to fusion to work. So the job of the experimental team is to put all of the pieces together and ensure that nothing goes wrong. Uh, that actually starts months earlier for a shot. We begin working with the design team uh, to decide on a concept that we want to test. Once that's decided, then we work with our colleagues in target fabrication and the laser science in order to bring those pieces of the experiment in. And then a few days before the shot, it, it's handed off to the operations crews in the facility. We work with them to actually execute the experiment because they're the ones who are actually hands-on in the facility making this a reality. The shot goes off, it takes only a few billionths of a second, and so we need an exquisite suite of diagnostics to measure what happened. And with those measurements, we can then increase our understanding of the particular um, experiment. I want to emphasize that each experiment we do is building on 60 years of work in this field and more than a decade on NIF itself. So we use that previous understanding in order to um, field design our experiments. Each experiment then contributes to the overall knowledge, both these main fusion ignition shots and also experiments that we do with specialized configurations and specialized diagnostics, all building the understanding that allows us to make progress. All that work led up to a moment just after 1 a.m. last Monday when we took a shot and we started to see um, the <laughs> Hopefully that's uh, not representative, but we took a shot just after 1 a.m. Uh, last Monday, and as the data started to come in, we saw uh, the first indications that we had produced more fusion energy than the laser input. And so I'm very excited to be here on behalf of the experimental team uh, and with my colleagues on behalf of the entire NIF team to discuss it with you. Um, so good, good morning, I'm Annie Kreicher. I'm the principal designer for the experiment and the campaign and also team lead for integrated modeling of these experiments. And I'm here to represent the entire design team. So the role of a designer is to define the input conditions to the experiment to achieve the desired plasma conditions. And that includes the target geometry, dimensions, materials, etc. Um, as well as the laser pulse. So we don't just smack the target with all the laser energy all at once. We define very specific powers at very specific times to achieve uh, the desired conditions. Um, and we do this using a variety of tools, including complex plasma physics simulations, analytical models, and we benchmark them against experimental data. Um, so the ultimate goal, as Alex mentioned, is uh, to create a design that can reach the extreme conditions required for fusion ignition on a NIF. And in doing so, we were able to reach pressures more than two times the center of the sun on the last experiment and about 150 million degrees. Um, and this requires a great deal of finesse and design optimization to reach these conditions, as well as continual learning um, over the many years of, of designs and results that we've collected uh, at NIF. And uh, specifically, there were two design changes that were made leading up to the most recent result uh, that fed into it. So this most recent result is part of a new campaign or a new effort to make uh, use of the new laser capability that Jam will talk about next. Um, and that is making the capsule that holds the fusion fuel a little bit thicker. And uh, that does two things. That gives us more margin for achieving ignition uh, when we have uh, non-optimal fielding conditions, as well as it lets us burn up more of the DT fusion fuel. Um, so the first experiment in this campaign was performed in September. And uh, the, the experiment we're talking about today made intentional design changes from the se September shot also to improve the symmetry of the implosion. Um, and with that, I'm happy to be here and to take questions and very excited about uh, our team's work on this. All right, good morning. I'm Jean-Michel De Nicola, Chief Engineer for NIF Laser Systems. I'm representing the team of technician, engineer, and scientists who design, build, operate, and improve this uh, unique laser facility. Um, together, our team is standing on the shoulder of multiple generations of optical material and laser physicists uh, who design and optimize ever-increasing uh, performance in terms of the laser delivery. Following the seminal paper from John Knuckles Livermore, 
who basically laid down the concept for um, nuclear fusion using lasers. Uh, however, we also want to acknowledge uh, numerous collaborators, um, other national labs, university, industry, as well as international partners, um, and of course, continued support from DOE and NSA in Congress for this mission so important for national security. Thanks to outstanding science and technology and our team, Livermore with collaborator made the impossible possible. The NIF laser is the largest laser in the world. It has the size of uh, three football fields and it delivers an energy in excess of two million joules with a peak power of 500 trillion watts. For a very short amount of time, we are talking only about a few billionth of a seconds, it exceeds the entire uh, grid, uh, US power grid. Um, the um, laser, however, um, achieving the ignition, however, requires more than brute force. As Annie described, there are extremely fine tunings that needs to be performed to match the condition for ignition. Uh, precision has been our focus for the last few years, and we have been delivering more symmetric implosion and more reproducible uh, experiments. Um, in addition, thanks to the continued investment from the nation, we have been able to deliver 8% more energy on the experiments last week compared to the one last year. Um, it, it goes along with uh, additional efforts that will be brought during the summer and uh, in a, in next summer we'll be able to design experiments and field shots with additional 8% of laser energy providing more margins for ignition. In the future with a sustainment and upgrade investment the NIF laser could produce even higher energies and power and um, give the promise to larger uh, target gains. That would be enabling additional extreme conditions for our science-based stockpile stewardship program and maintain the United States of America leadership in this field. I'll pass it over to uh, Michael. Morning, I am Michael Staterman. I am the program manager for target fabrication at Livermore. I'm here to present a team of over 100 members uh, that is responsible for making almost all targets shot on NIF and that comprises members of General Atomics, of Dime Materials in Germany, and of Lawrence Livermore. The most important component that we deliver for fusion targets is the fuel capsule. Fuel capsule is a BB point sized shell made of diamond and that needs to be as perfect as possible. We've been working over the last 16 years on continuously improving the quality of these shells to get to the state where we are today. And in turn, that effort has been based on decades of prior capsule development activities that have been done at Livermore and elsewhere. Today's shells are almost perfectly round. They're 100 times smoother than a mirror, and they have a tiny tube attached to them that's about a 50th the diameter of a hair through which the fuel is filled into the shell. As you can imagine, perfection is really hard, and so we've yet to get there. We still have tiny flaws on our shells, smaller than bacteria, that could be, for example, pits on the surface or holes in the wall. And despite their small size, these flaws still have the uh, potential to affect the experiment. So not only do we make the shells, but we also characterize the shells and, make sh and share the results with our colleagues so that we can select the best shell for each experiment. How strongly an experiment is affected by the flaws depends on the design uh, input that Annie was talking about. And um, it looks like the result from Monday is a more robust design that is less affected. Uh, this is very encouraging for us because um, we know that the shell that uh, we shot had flaws in it, and this gives us confidence that we can make shells of equal quality or even better quality in the future that will be able to reproduce this experiment or even improve on it. Uh, yeah, so with that, I'll pass it on to Art. Thanks. Uh, my name is uh, Arthur Pack. I'm the team lead for Stagnation Science, which is really focused on trying to understand how to create the conditions to achieve ignition at the NIF. So I'm responsible for coordinating the portfolio of integrated experiments that's been pursuing ignition, as well as overseeing the analysis groups that take these observations we get from the experiments and try to understand the conditions of the fusion plasma. And this has been really critically important to understand these conditions, as I'll talk about. And it's really been enabled by sort of state-of-the-art diagnostics, uh, optical, x-ray, and nuclear diagnostics that have been developed 
over decades of work by an exceptional team of engineers and scientists from Lawrence Livermore and from other national laboratories in the US, the UK, and France. In addition, with major contributions from our uh, domestic and international academic and industry partners. So for each experiment, we field over 50 scientific measurements to diagnose key quantities of the reacting fusion plasma, such as the temperature, the fusion energy yield, the duration over which this occurs. And to give you a, a sense of scale and just how remarkable these, you know, these, these diagnostics are, the plasma we're trying to measure is a, is a tenth of a millimeter in diameter. So that's the thickness of a strand or two of human hair. As was mentioned, um, the temperatures of these plasmas are over 100 million degrees. So that's 10 times hotter than the center of the sun. And the entire re reactions occur in a fraction of a nanosecond. So that's about a billion times faster than you can blink your eye. And then as Alex mentioned, we're only able to get these great measurements due to the sort of tireless work of, of technicians and operators who, who field them at the NIF facility and, and, and allow us to get these, these, these amazing observations to help us understand what's going on. And these observations have been really critical for uh, our progress. So they've, they've helped to identify, quantify, and mitigate uh, degradations or loss mechanisms which have impeded our progress. They allow us to test hypotheses and design changes uh, to understand what are the sensitivities of the system. And so uh, I'm here today uh, on behalf of these diagnostic groups um, to, to help answer any questions and talk about uh, what we can learn from these experiments. Thanks. Good morning. My name is Tammy Ma, and I am the lead for the Lawrence Livermore Institutional Initiative in Inertial Fusion Energy, or what we call IFE. Developing an economically attractive approach to fusion energy is a grand scientific and engineering challenge. Without a doubt, it will be a monumental undertaking. However, the potential benefits are enormous. Clean, carbon-free, abundant, reliable energy capable of meeting the world's energy demands. And furthermore, providing for the energy sovereignty and energy security of the US. As the Secretary mentioned earlier today, this spring, the White House hosted a summit uh, announcing a bold decadal vision for fusion energy, building on great advances we had in both inertial and magnetic confinement fusion. These recent results on the NIF are the first time in a laboratory anywhere on Earth we were able to demonstrate more energy coming out of a fusion reaction than was put in. This lays the groundwork it, is, it demonstrates the basic scientific feasibility of inertial fusion energy and sets the roadmap for us to move forward to even higher gains and towards fusion pilot plants in the coming decades. The Department of Energy, Office of Fusion Energy Sciences recently commissioned a basic research needs report in inertial fusion energy. This report will help lay out the framework for a new IFE program here in the US. And that report should be coming out imminently. Such a program will inevitably, inevitably require participation from across the community, both the public sector, but the private sector as well. So of course, new fusion startup companies, their investors, national labs, universities, academia, public utilities, and more. We look forward to working with the Department of Energy to leverage and capitalize on these great results for a fusion energy future. The time is now. And I will hand it back to Mark. Thanks, Tim. Um, so we're going to ask each, each uh, panelist a question here, and then we'll open it up to the floor. Um, Annie, this experiment improved on, a, on an experiment, as you mentioned, that we had done in September of 2022, and it was a modified design from the one in August of 2021. Can you explain how you used physics insights and simulations to make changes in the design for this recent experiment? Sure. Um, so we do rely on our uh, detailed radiation hydrodynamic simulations to design many aspects of our implosions. However, we know that there's areas of parameter space where we might not be as predictive. So we have um, developed playbook, experimental playbooks and analytical models 
And I used a combination, uh, our design team used a combination of both to make the adjustment from September going into this latest experiment. Uh, there was two sort of different flavors of symmetry adjustments that were made. One is during sort of the second half of the laser time history, and one is during the first half of the laser time history. During the second half of the laser time history, we transferred more energy between laser beams to control the symmetry. So that's actually quite a useful tool, and uh, if you haven't heard about it, it's really awesome. You can move energy between beams and, and control symmetry that way. Um, in doing so, you have to go back and readjust the symmetry during the first half of the laser pulse. And uh, we did that, but we also did that uh, making an additional adjustment with um, improved models based on data that were collected just in the last few months. Um, so in that piece, we really do rely on our models to uh, benchmark against tuning data and then extrapolate out to the design space. Um, and just for perspective, we're talking about compressing something the size of a basketball down to the size of a key, controlling that compression symmetry to about 1% in, in drive, and also the final symmetry to just a few percent. So it's quite a challenging problem, and uh, we have great tools to get there. Thanks, Amy. Uh, John Michel, for many years, the maximum laser energy on NIF was 1.9 megajoules. But in this experiment, you turned the laser up to uh, 2.05 megajoules. Uh, how did you and your team uh, make sure that this would be safe to operate the laser at these higher, higher laser energies? Thank you, Mark. First of all, I would like to point out that the National Ignition Facility is one of the first generation of the inertial confinement fusion to meet and exceed its requirement. So it's, uh, it's by itself uh, quite a, a grand challenge to do that because those laser architectures are extremely complex and are a marvel of um, engineering and laser physics and nonlinear optics. Um, second, uh, since the commissioning of the National Ignition Facility, we have continuously increased the energy and power over you know, a few years to make sure that we were obtaining the regime where uh, ignition experiment could take place in favorable conditions. In parallel, there was a tremendous amount of investment in terms of optics, science and technology, as well as laser physics, to have the optics that would be um, higher performance compared to the previous generation. And we gained orders of magnitude compared to previous generation, no, no questions about it. Uh, we perform also a lot of work trying to control the, uh, the shape of the laser in space and time to make sure we can transmit the maximum throughput through the optics uh, with maximum reliability. Last but not least, we also uh, figured out that some of the debris are migrating back into the laser from the target experiment and ignition when it takes place. Debris are transported back you know, near the optics. And um, you know, finding and mitigating those debris sources was also a key uh, instrument. So very minor modification to the laser architecture. And, and we published a paper in 2019 in nuclear fusion, if you want more detail about that. Thanks, Jam. Uh, Alex, uh, many, many elements have to come together to enable a successful NIF experiment. We need a, a good target, a cryogenic ice layer, we need the lasers to be specified, and we need to make sure the diagnostics are going to be taking the pictures at the right time. So how did you prepare for this experiment knowing it had the potential to be a really exciting shot? Yeah, so one of the things that's so challenging with these experiments is that any one thing going wrong can be enough to prevent ignition. So everything has to be right. And so we really have to sweat the small stuff. To kind of give you a sense for that, um, Annie discussed our uh, tuning of the symmetry. We had a, a debate over a laser setting equivalent to five trillionths of a meter going into this experiment. We had a discussion with the laser science team uh, over timing discrepancies of 25 trillionths of a second. With the target, each target we look at all of the flaws that Michael was describing that are the size of a bacteria to decide if they're acceptable or not. They then grow a cryogenic DT ice layer, which has the same sorts of requirements. Uh, bacteria size defects can be problematic. And then we're setting up the diagnostics where um, small timing errors, you know, a billionth of a second would be um, an eternity for us in this experiment. We're trying to image something that's the brightest thing on Earth for 100 trillionths of a second. And so getting all that right is a team effort uh, going through an intense review process. Thanks. Uh, Art, uh, how do we know this experiment passed the threshold of ignition and got more fusion energy out than laser energy in? 
um, uh, for the first time in history. Yeah, thanks. So um, in these experiments, we use um, deuterium and tritium as our fusion fuel, which are uh, isotopes of hydrogen. And when these two ions fuse, uh, they release a, a helium uh, ion or an alpha particle and a neutron, and they're released with uh, very well-known energies. Now the alpha particle, it stays in the plasma, further heating it, leading to more fusion reactions, while the neutrons largely escape. And so if we can measure the number of escaping neutrons, uh, then we know how many reactions took place. And then we just multiply the number of reactions by the energy released uh, for each fusion, and that's how we uh, measure the fusion energy. So in this experiment, uh, to get a target gain one, uh, we used 2.05 uh, megajoules of laser energy. So to exceed one, we need to make at least that much uh, fusion energy. So the way we, we measure the number of neutrons, we, we do that uh, multiple ways uh, using independent diagnostics. Um, but one of the methods we use is to place a high purity metal sample uh, close to the, to the reactions. That gets irradiated by the uh, escaping neutrons and becomes radioactive. So the unstable states in this uh, uh, foil uh, will then decay. And because we know very well um, the rate of activation and decay, we can then measure uh, how many neutrons went through that foil, uh, what the total number of neutrons were, and how much fusion energy was released. We have other methods. So another uh, independent method is to turn the escaping neutrons into a charged particle spectrum, disperse that using a magnetic uh, spectrometer and uh, sweep that onto a piece of film and so we can actually measure the number of uh, sort of incident neutrons directly. Um, so all these different methods uh, give us uh, uh, very, very high confidence that we produced 3.15 megajoules of fusion energy, which corresponds to a gain of roughly one and a half. So that's how we know. Thanks, Art. So Michael, you talked about the targets. They're incredible marvels of engineering and manufacturing. Can you briefly describe how you've been working to actually make them even better, the thin spherical diamond shells that contain the fusion fuel? Sure, Mark. Uh, so the main thing, the main problem that we have right now with getting perfect capsules are small flaws. And so to be able to improve on the flaws, the first thing that we have to be able to do is actually see them, measure them, count them, and uh, quantify how many of the flaws are on a shell. The primary tool that we use today to characterize a shell is computer uh, X-ray tomography. Um, X-ray tomography generates a lot of data, and in the past it has required trained experts a lot of time to go through these images and basically find the needle in the haystack. So now what we're working on is software that helps us in this process that hopefully will be more accurate than a human in the longer run that will help us quantify exactly to see how many flaws are, there are, how, many, how big they are and whether when we're making a change to the deposition, uh, to the fabrication uh, process, whether that actually improves the number of flaws in their size. So that's the characterization part. On the actual improvement of the material, we are working very closely with our collaborators in Germany at Dime Materials uh, to look at the fabrication conditions. Uh, we're working as a team using the other's uh, capabilities as a reference to our own so that we can isolate the problem to machine operation or surroundings. Uh, and this process has been very fruitful for narrowing down a set of conditions that has allowed us to improve the uh, target beyond where we are today. Thanks, Michael. Okay, Tammy. Um, so to power the laser uh, for this experiment, the two, to get that 2.05 megajoules, we had to pull about 300 megajoules from the grid. Um, and, and then we got out 3.15 megajoules of fusion energy, right? So, so why do we think it's possible to turn this into an energy source in the future? That's a great question. Thank you, Mark. The NIF is a scientific demonstration facility. And when we built the NIF, the considerations that you have to build that facility are a little bit different than if you're going to build a fusion power plant. So for example, maximizing the efficiency of every single component is not necessarily the most important thing. Um, and so for example, the wall plug efficiency of the laser was not necessarily a very important requirement for this science facility. 
However, um, as Kim alluded to, the, the NIF is now over 20 years old. Um, the technology inside the NIF is 80s, 90s technology, um, and things have progressed quite a lot since then. We have new laser architectures that can not only run at rep rate, but are far more efficient, up to something around 20% wall plug efficiency. There's also been enormous advancements in target fabrication, new materials, uh, computation and, and simulations, uh, the application of machine learning. So it's a really exciting time because we get to incorporate all of these emerging technologies with this new scientific understanding that we've developed to really push towards inertial fusion energy. And I'll also note the perseverance it took us to get here. As has been mentioned, it's been 60 years since ignition was first dreamed of using lasers. And it's really a testament to the perseverance, dedication of the folks that made this happen. It also means we have the perseverance to get to fusion energy on the grid. Thanks, Tim. Uh, and thanks, panel. And then uh, now we're uh, going to open it up to questions. Uh, I don't Testing. All right. Hi, everybody. I'm NNSA Public Affairs Deputy Director Shaila Hassan. I want to thank those of you who stayed for this more technical discussion with the folks that actually made this happen. Um, it's a very exciting day for NNSA. So we're going to start the Q&A portion. We have a little bit more time uh, with media. So if there are any media folks who came late and need to move up, this is where we have media seated, just to make sure you get your questions in. And my colleague Jeremy will be there on the other side to get a mic if you're a little too far and feel like you need to reach. So. If you could please state your name and your outlet before your question, otherwise I will remind you. Uh, hey, it's Ari Natter from Bloomberg. Uh, what was the cost of the targets you're using? Uh, and also, what fraction of the fusion fuel was actually converted to energy during the shot? Thank you. I want to take the, uh, I'm happy to jump in, Michael. You want to, um, I think the way to think of the targets is how long does it take for someone to, to build them, right? Because the predominant cost is the, the labor of the people. Um, and so they take months to build, right? Uh, well, if you, so the, the components that comprise a target uh, take a variety of uh, different times to make. The actual assembly of the target only takes about two weeks. Uh, to make the fuel capsule, however, makes, uh, takes seven months from the inception of what you want to the delivery of the capsule. Um, the targets that we are using today are designed for science. Right? They're designed to be flexible so that we can reconfigure them as we want to learn different things. Um, and they're designed to be able to see what's going on. So these targets are not designed for uh, fusion energy. Is, is there a dollar amount, though, for the monetary figure? <laughs> no, I don't think it, it's, it's kind of like we're sized. We have a staff that can produce the targets we need per year for, on NIF. And so uh, it's really about a workforce more than a dollars per target. The components, the actual amount of gold or carbon or whatever, are, are actually really, really cheap, right? I mean, the, the, the actual cost of the materials and the targets is next to nothing. It's, it's all the labor that goes into it that makes it uh, um, time consuming. To answer the second part of your question, it was about 4% of the DT that was burned on the shot. All right, thank you. And before we go back to media, we have a question from our administrator, Jill Ruby. Well, thanks. I I often talk about how special the national laboratories are because we do team science. And there's no better example of that than what we just heard from you. But I'm guessing maybe you didn't come um, expecting to do exactly what just happened. So I'd be very interested in just like short stories about why did you come and why do you stay uh, at the lab? Thank you. I think I can, uh, I can give a quick answer to that. So I actually toured NIF um, while it was under construction as an undergraduate. And so seeing the scale of what was possible at the national laboratories um, is what drew me in, as well as being able to see you know, the ability to do great science that has an actual impact on national security and, and energy applications. And so yeah, I hope that anyone watching who's inspired by this current moment comes to work with us in the future and take this to the next level. Yeah, and I actually have a very similar story, so you might notice a trend here. Um, 
I came as an undergraduate in 2004 and I saw NIF and I thought this is a once in a lifetime opportunity to be part of this, large interdisciplinary teams working together, um, grand challenge on problems that move humanity forward and are so important for the nation. Um, also, it's just fun to tell your friends you shoot big lasers. Um, and my dad really liked it as well, so. <laughs> All right, we've got one question over here. Hi, Michael Greshko, National Geographic. Thank you all for being here, and congratulations. Um, what time on December 5th did the shot occur? And for each of you, in the minutes and hours after that, how did you first learn that this shot was special? I can start with that. So the shot went off, I believe, at 1.03 a.m. last Monday. Um, and so I was up to look at the data. Um, and as the data started to come in, we started to see some you know, indications that, that this had happened. And one of the first things I did was call one of the diagnostic experts to, to double check the data. And we kind of went from there. So I had vivid dreams of all possible <laughs> outcomes from the shot. This always happens before a shot from like complete success to utter failure. Um, and then I woke up, thankfully, Alex had sent me a message. So by the time I woke up, I saw that it, it wasn't a failure. And, um, and then, of course, I start emailing you, texting you right away. And, um, yeah, so just amazing feeling of you start looking at, you see one uh, diagnostic and you think, well, maybe that's not real. And then you start to see more and more diagnostics rolling in, pointing to the same thing. And it's just a, a great feeling. So for the laser team, the, the, the work started earlier in the night because we had to check and make sure during the preparation stages of the experiment we're on track to a successful delivery. So numerous phone calls, emails, checking of the results real time, uh, giving the green light to proceed, um, and then the, the relief when we see the result and the laser didn't screw up the experiment. That was relief <laughs> number one. And then we start to receive the text with potential yields and that's, uh, you know, Eureka and Eura moments. So. Well, for target fabrication, our work usually ends somewhere about a week before the shot when we deliver the target to the facility. Uh, we had high hopes for this one, so I was checking email as soon as I woke up um, to see how the shot did and was very excited about the numbers that I saw. Yeah, so um, as Annie mentioned, um, we're building off of prior experiments and, um, you know, we had uh, good reason to be optimistic for this experiment, so I was very <laughs> keyed in and, and curious. Um, but as it started going later and later, I you know, got to get the kids up in the morning. So I was like, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go to bed. But uh, I woke up at 3 in the morning just out of sleep, and I went to check my email. <laughs> and I, I saw the number, and, of course, I'd, I'd done the math before the experiment, so I knew what number I, I, I wanted to see for gain greater than 1. And it, so the preliminary data came out, and I was like, holy smokes. So... Uh, that's how I sort of, and then I went back to bed or tried to go back to bed, <laughs> which was, you know. Um, I actually didn't find out until the next morning. I was at the airport at SFO about to board a plane to come to D.C. actually to uh, attend the Fusion Power Associates meeting, uh, which is an annual meeting where we have fusion leaders coming together to really work together on how to push forward fusion energy. Um, but anyways, I got, I got a call from uh, my boss um, saying, I think we got ignition. And I, uh, I burst into tears. Um, and I was jumping up and down <laughs> in the waiting area, the crazy person. Um, and uh, yeah, the tears were streaming down my face. Um, after all these years, every time I walk into the National Ignition Facility, I still get goosebumps. And so it is a, it's a wonderful place to work, uh, and I'm so proud of this team. Thank you all. James Reardon, Science News Magazine. It, since the ignition, uh, the prior one, uh, that was an important event, have there been events like this that have been failures, that have been disappointments? And why on earth would you do it at 1 a.m.? Is there a technical <laughs> reason? Yeah, so um, yeah, following uh, last, last year's experiment, we um, tried to repeat that experiment um, three or four times. And what we learned from those experiments was that um, this design was still very sensitive to the target defects um, 
uh, that were present. And so we were able to quantify the impact and understand um, you know, the origin uh, of these defects. And so um, knowing that, we, we went for improved designs uh, to make ourselves more robust. Um, we used that knowledge to try to pick the best capsules to minimize the impact. And so um, you know, that, that's why, uh, what led us to, to this, to this uh, uh, event here and why uh, 1 a.m. Um, so NIF runs 24-7. Uh, um, so to grow these ice layers, it's a, it's a multi-day process. And so um, and it's not fully deterministic. So you'll try, it will fail, you'll try to grow again. And so it just happens that the shot cycle goes that way. And uh, the, we take the shot when we're <laughs> ready to take the shot. So. Uh, James Osborne, Houston Chronicle. Um, uh, there's two, tech, you know, two fusion technologies: magnetic confinement and inertial. Um, does this? Can you sort of explain where your breakthrough? Does that? Does that sort of put inertial at the forefront now? Is that? Is that the technology? You know, society is going to pursue, or does it have implications for magnetic that you know might allow that to continue? Um, I think it was implied earlier that Magnetic had sort of seen more advances of late. Um, obviously, though, this is the big breakthrough. So if somebody could sort of explain that. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, there's, there's definitely pros and cons uh, for each different approach. Um, and there's different technology developments that need to occur. Um, and so uh, both uh, Magnetic Fusion and Inertial have made great advances in the past couple of years. Um, there's also been enormous uh, private sector investment, um, actually more on the magnetic side than the inertial side um, in recent years. Um, I think uh, what we've been able to demonstrate on the NIF is a, is a burning plasma. Um, we've gotten gain. Um, however, like Kim alluded to, um, we're a little bit farther behind in some of the technology developments because that's just not what we've been focused on the past few years. Um, that being said, there's a lot of different commonalities. There's a lot of commonalities um, between the two where we can learn from each other. Um, there's uh, burning plasma physics, material science, reactor engineering, um, and uh, we're very supportive of each other in this community. Um, a win for either inertial or magnetic confinement uh, is a win for all of us, and we really just want to see fusion energy happen. Um, and the point is, though, that there are different technological risks for both of them. Um, right now, fusion is so incredibly impactful and important uh, for humankind that what we really want to do is maximize the potential pathways to success. So we want to carry these different approaches and, and see what will really work. Um, so right now, there are a number of different approaches um, to um, uh, target physics that could actually get us to high gain, high margin. Um, all of those have slightly different uh, drivers. So for what we're doing on the NIF, we use high energy lasers, but there are designs using um, heavy ions, um, pulse power, et cetera, et cetera. Um, um, and there's been a number of different uh, integrated studies to try to pull all of this together. Um, really where we are right now is at a divergent point. We've been very lucky to be able to leverage the work that the NNSA has done for inertial confinement fusion. But if we want to get serious about IFE, we are at a point where we need to invest in those technologies. We need to figure out what that integrated system looks like because the target like, like Michael said, is complex. It takes a long time to build. Um, and what we need for a power plant, it has to be simple, it has to be high volume, it needs to be robust, um, and there are trade-offs. If you can get to higher gain with your target, you can turn down your laser energy or your laser efficiency a little bit. 
There are decisions to be made about the materials that you would use for your reactor. Um, those would impact your design as well. Um, so what we're doing now uh, with the Department of Energy is actually embarking on doing these integrated system studies. Again, uh, with our, our best known information um, about uh, technology as it's evolved today and to figure out where the, the biggest gaps are, where we need to invest, where we need to buy down risk. Um, and that will be an ongoing activity um, for, for quite a few years. Um, but with this bold decadal vision, we are really trying to accelerate um, and put together these designs to see what is the, the most viable, feasible design and all come together to work on it. Hi, Dave Netchup here, FedScoop. Uh, the director mentioned earlier that uh, machine learning played a key role in sort of the in-between between the thresh reaching the threshold to ignition and then this latest test. So I'm curious, uh, how have advances in machine learning and computing helped you in your work, and how do you anticipate they might help you moving forward? Yeah, I can take that question. Um, so we have made quite a bit of advances in our machine learning models to kind of tie together our complex radiation hydrodynamic simulations with the experimental data and learning. Um, specifically going between the August 8, 2021 experiment and this, this latest uh, experiment, we used it more for the predictability phase versus the design phase uh, for, the, for this change. So for this change, we sort of used our traditional um, design methods of not, you know, not running thousands of simulations. But then we fed the, the design to the team, the, the CogSim machine learning team, and had them have them do an analysis of the design. And they did find that it had a higher probability of, achieve, of achieving gain of one. So uh, with, with the CogSim models, we were able to look at uh, more if the design is more robust to some of the issues that we had been having last year. Thanks, Annie. Now I believe we have time for one or two more questions so before we go back to NetGeo. Uh, David Crandall, uh, retired from Department of Energy, where I spent 30 years, and most of it related to fusion, uh, and, mo and most of it related to NIF. The target, the uh, target for 08, 08, 21, the physics ignition shot, was deemed to be the most pure target you ever shot. How did this one compare? Yes, as you mentioned, the target for 210808 was probably the most pristine shell that we've ever had. It even compared uh, favorably to the other shells in the batch, as we learned later on as we reanalyzed the data for all those shells. This target here had a substantial number of flaws compared to that one. Specifically, at higher, uh, it has tungsten inclusions um, in, a, in a large number. All right, time for our final question. Uh, James Rudin, Science News Magazine. Um, <clears throat> so this experiment um, is specifically interested in, 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 the, in the search for ignition, but most of your research at, is, is focused on stockpile stewardship, is it, is it not? And in that case, what fraction is dedicated to this sort of research? What fraction is dedicated to stockpile stewardship? And do these sorts of shots have any important information in them for stockpile stewardship? Sure. Um, I'm happy to take that one. Uh, so the ignition work we're doing is for stockpile stewardship, right? Our thermonuclear weapons have fusion ignition uh, that takes place in our weapons. And so studying fusion ignition is something we do to support the stockpile stewardship program. In addition, fusion ignition creates these very extreme environments that we have no other way to access on Earth. And in fact, in this experiment, for the first time ever, we were able to put some samples of materials that are important for our uh, future stockpile modernization efforts that are going on at Lawrence Livermore War today in very close uh, to this intense neutron burst and then see how did they respond to that intense neutron burst. So we're actually using the output from these really cool science experiments, uh, uh, and which we're also trying to understand, but we're also using it to actually test materials uh, for stewardship applications. But to your other question, um, roughly speaking, about 15% of the experiments we do on NIF are indirect drive experiments of the type that this experiment was. We do another roughly 15% that are other types of fusion experiments, inertial confinement fusion, but using different approaches. And then the rest of them look at things like the behavior of materials at high pressures, 
and getting data that's important to use in our simulations for our nuclear weapons. Uh, understanding the behavior of radiation in very complex environments and geometries. Understanding how hydrodynamic plasmas mix uh, at very high temperatures. All of those things uh, help us um, benchmark our simulation tools, uh, learn new things about how matter behaves in these really extreme conditions and underpins the confidence we have in, in, in our deterrent. Thank you. We had a question over here. Well, thank you. Um, how many questions do I get to ask? <laughs> <laughs> as many as you want. No, this is, this is really exciting. Uh, my understanding was that uh, the experiment in, uh, in, two, in, in 2021 was a little unexpected result, which was really good news. Uh, and then it was kind of hard to repeat that result. Uh, so was it more the target uh, and, and something that uh, Annie brought up that I hadn't been aware of is the, the time history of the, of the uh, laser pulses is also important. So uh, first question is what's, what's more dominant, the, the, the time history or the target? Uh, and a question for Arthur, uh, how many orders of magnitude of neutron flux do you have to monitor to get a full picture? So I, I can uh, answer the, the last question first, perhaps. So, you know, as Alex pointed out, you know, um, many things have to happen, um, have to go right, basically, for, for, for these experiments to really reach very, very high yields and gains. So we have to set up our diagnostics uh, to capture that event, but we also have to set up the diagnostics to capture uh, lower orders of magnitude so that if it doesn't go right, we understand what happened, what was the failure mechanism so that we can fix it in the future. And so, um, you know, right now, I think we have something like three orders or so of, of dynamic range that we can measure. So we, so we have predictions of how we set up the diagnostics. And we try to go above and below to make sure we, we, we get good measurements. Does that answer your question? Yeah, so I can take a crack at the other one. Um, so I'm going into 21.0808, or August 8th of 2021 experiment. Um, we predicted about half the yield increase that we got. We got about eight times the yield increase, and we predicted about four times. Um, and the reason for that is because we had improved the capsule quality, like was mentioned earlier. So going into the pre-shot prediction, we're assuming uh, the same capsule quality with some other design changes that were being made. Um, we did perform a set of experiments after that to try to piece apart which is quality and which is the other design changes, and it was pretty consistent with that sort of split between the two. Um, following that experiment, we haven't been able to replicate the same capsule quality, and uh, that is a main driver because these uh, defects are extremely difficult to model and predict. Um, it's been a main driver in the performance as well as the predictability. Um, so then the thought was to try to design our way around uh, some of these uh, stringent requirements. And what was the other part of your question? The time history. <laughs> the time history, yeah, thanks. Yeah, thank you. Um, so the time history, there's different forms of asymmetries. And the one that I'm talking about, uh, the change that was made between September and this most recent experiment, was a slightly different type of, that's an intrinsic symmetry correction. Um, during the repeat experiments, we did have two experiments that had an anomalous uh, laser deviation, which is, is a mode one, so that means, uh, for example, if the laser delivered differently on top versus bottom, that would push the implosion in one direction. So something that's not designed or expected that did impact two of those experiments. But ever since then, um, we've been quite good, and, and maybe JM can talk about the improvements made there, that that hasn't been as big of an issue. Yeah, I can elaborate if you like. Uh, we basically are um, in the process of modernizing the, the, what we call the front end of the laser, which is based on the fiber optics technology. Um, the NIF laser was first commissioned at low level in 2001, so this part of the laser was literally 20 year old. And as you can imagine, in telecom industry over 20 years, there has been many revolutions. And so we were able to catch up and capitalize on the latest technologies to improve this uh, delivery. All right, time for our final question. I think we have one over here. Um, James Osborne, Houston Chronicle again. Um, I think you've probably answered this, but maybe just for the layman about, among us. Um, so if the shell quality wasn't as clean on this experiment, what, what in fact made the difference 
where you were able to achieve this breakthrough this time. What, 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 do, you, what, what do you attribute it to? Yeah, so um, the, the, we shot basically the same capsule quality in September, so that part remained constant between the two experiments. And in September, we achieved about 1.22 megajoules. Um, so being able to first achieve megajoule yields again with worse capsule quality than August 8th, 2021, um, that was a first step and that was attributed to the, the laser enhanced laser capability and the design change of the thicker target. And then moving between September and the most recent experiment, the only changes to the input conditions were to improve this intrinsic low mode uh, asymmetry. So make the implosion more symmetric as it's coming in, you can better uh, couple your driver energy to the hot, DT the hot plasma. All right, I'd like to thank everyone for coming, and I'd like to thank Dr. Herman and the panel for taking time to share this amazing achievement with us after what must be a whirlwind week. One more round of applause, please. And with that, that concludes our NIF press conference event. Thank you for coming.